understand that these are gifts of thanksgiving. They're not gifts of payment. This isn't our way of paying our rent or paying for our food because, God, we know that you are our shelter. You are our sustenance. And there's no way that we can afford you. So I want to pray that we could just give thanks. Thank you for giving yourself to us. Thank you for loving us, knowing that there's no way that we can pay for that love. Thank you for your son. It's his name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your hymn books to number 190. Let's join together in singing, Are You Washed in the Blood? spoken against the Lord 
and against you. Pray to the Lord that he can take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. We're going to look at a text from the New Testament, from Luke's Gospel. We're going to look at the 7th chapter, starting in the 11th verse. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that are in it. And we thank you that because of your Holy Spirit, we can understand them. Father, I ask that you would speak through me this morning, that you would speak your words and not my own. And Father, I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to speak your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So what happens in this first story? group of people sin against God. The Israelites were really good at that. They did it all the time. Um, sounds familiar. Sounds a lot like us. But they've sinned against God. They're out in the wilderness, and basically what happens is they get really sick of their free food. Um, God has provided for them. He has given them manna from heaven, and they have to do nothing for it. All they have to do every morning is walk outside and pick it up, and put it in baskets, and they're good to go. They have their perfect food for every day. But they decide to complain about that. Uh, apparently that wasn't good enough for them. So God gets angry, I think very justifiably so. He is providing for these people on a daily basis in a perfect way, and they complain against him. So he sends fiery serpents into their camp, and the snakes begin to bite the people and the people begin to die. And you may say, well, John, that seems like kind of a harsh punishment for complaining about the food. Well, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, and these people sinned against God, so they deserved what they were getting. They couldn't help themselves either. It wasn't as if they could just drive to the nearest hospital and say, hey, I got bit by a snake, I don't feel so good, can you give me something to make me better, and they would be healed. That wasn't the case, right? They had nowhere to go. Um, if they got bit, they died. They see that this is not going to end well. And so they go to Moses, and they say, Moses, we've sinned against God, and we've sinned against you. Please pray to God that he will take these serpents away, that he'll provide a way out. And so God has mercy. He provides a way out for the people. He tells Moses to make a staff with a snake on it. Where have you guys seen that before? The hospital, right? Or any doctor's office. It's the symbol for modern medicine today um, is a staff with a snake on it because of the story. And all the people have to do to be healed is just look at the snake on the staff. That's it. They don't have to work. They don't have to do anything. They just have to look, and they're healed. So what about the second story? There's a man that we encounter on the way to his own funeral. He's on the way to the grave. He's being carried on a bier 
uh, by his friends, by his family, and this seems to be a special catastrophe because he's leaving his mother, who's a widow. And so in this day and age, that was an even bigger deal because her son was the only person left to take care of her. So this is a really bad deal. And Jesus sees this, and he has compassion on the woman and on her son, and he walks up to the bier, and he tells the woman that her son's going to be healed, and he brings him back to life. He wasn't asleep, he wasn't sick, he wasn't in a coma, her son was dead, and Jesus brings him back to life. So I think there's some similarities between these stories. In both stories, we have a problem, right? In the first story, there's people who are dying because they're being bitten by snakes. In the second story, this young man is dead, and his mother has no way of providing for herself. Her only means of provision is gone. In both cases, in both stories, the people with the problem earned the situation they're in. The people of Israel complained, and they sinned against God, and so they earned this punishment that God has given them, right? The wages of sin is death, and so they're receiving that at the hand of the serpents. They earned their punishment. You may say, John, well, how did the, how did the dead guy earn his punishment? Well, we don't know. We don't know exactly what he did. Luke doesn't tell us that. But we do know that he was living and breathing for a while, so you can bet that he sinned against God. And so he deserved his punishment. In both cases, the people who need a solution to the problem, the people who earn the problem, don't have a way of fixing it. Right? The people of Israel, like I said, they, they can't heal themselves. They can't go to the hospital and say, hey, help me. They have no way out of the situation that they're in. And in the second story, the guy's dead. Right? Dead people don't bring themselves back to life. There's nothing he can do. He's stuck. He has no way of helping himself. I think we see some other examples of situations like this uh, even today. I think of blood and organ donation. Uh, there's somebody who, who has a problem and they need help, but they can't help themselves. It doesn't do you a lot of good to donate blood or organs to yourself. You're, you're kind of in the situation you're in. They need someone else's help. Uh, I think of mission trips, right? We go to help these people who are in situations where they can't help themselves. Um, or a, a case many of you may know about, um, a lot of times, this happened to my horse, actually. Uh, it's called foundered. When a horse gets foundered, basically what happens is it eats way too much grass because it's greedy and the grass is good, um, and it gets really bloated. And so it's in pain, so it lays down. The horse lays down. Once it lays down, this pressure continues to build up to the point that the horse can't stand back up by itself. And if the horse continues to lay down, which it will, without help, then the horse dies from all this pressure in its stomach. The only way that you can save a horse from this is you have to go and you have to make it get up and make it walk around until this pressure dissipates. This happened to my horse, I don't know, it was about six or seven years ago and we went out there and she was just laying down and wouldn't get up and we couldn't figure out why. And then finally my dad remembered uh, this condition and so we made her get up, we made her walk around and she's fine, she's still around. Um, she's an old horse, she was my parents' engagement present, so she's been around a while. Um, but in all these stories, the, the people or the animals with the problem can't help themselves, they're just stuck. So somebody else has to intervene, someone else has to help them. And in all these cases, the people who are saved from their situations deserve no praise, right? No one's going to praise the horse for its valiant effort to walk around and save itself from dying. Nobody is going to praise the person who receives the organ or the blood for coming back from this after they received it from someone else. Nobody is going to praise the people of Israel for their valiant effort to look at the snake on the staff. No one said, oh, you did such a good job looking at that snake. You earned your healing. No, right? And no one 
told the dead guy, great job coming back to life. Because he didn't do anything. Somebody else did the work in all these situations. So somebody else deserves the praise. Right? The people who donated the blood or the organs are the ones who deserve praise. God is the one who deserves the praise for providing a way out for the people of Israel. He's the one that deserves the praise for bringing this dead man back to life. I think this is a really, really good picture of the way your salvation looks and the way my salvation looks. We were dead. Nothing we could do to help ourselves, right? And we had earned our punishment. We sinned against God. There was no way that we could dig ourselves out of the hole that we were in. The Bible tells us for the wages of sin is death. We earned it. My dad says a quote I think you've heard him say before that I really like. The only thing that you and I contributed to our salvation was the sin that made it necessary. That's it. But all the time, we give ourselves credit for our salvation. We think that we bring something to God's team. We think, oh, God is really lucky to have us on his team. We give ourselves credit for something we didn't do. On the flip side of that, we think that we're bad people. We think that we have potential to lose our salvation when we don't do so good. Right, we pat ourselves on the back when we're doing really well. We think God's lucky to have us on his team. And when we're not doing so good, we think, wow, I may lose this. Maybe I won't get to heaven. The problem in both of these is that you're, you and I are taking credit for something that we didn't do. Right? We think the load is on us. It's not. Just like the people of Israel with the snake, just like the man who was brought back to life, God did the work in our salvation. You didn't do it. I didn't do it. God did all the work. So we have no part in this. We have no load to bear. So we don't need to feel bad, or we don't need to feel like we're going to lose our salvation when we're not doing so well. You're not carrying the weight. You're not doing the work. The dead man can't bring himself back to life, right? He can't reach over and grab those paddles, say clear, and shock himself, and he's back to life. No, it doesn't work that way. The Israelites couldn't save themselves from the snake venom. They had no way of doing that. The dead widow's son, or the widow's dead son, could not bring himself back to life. So what did the people do? It says they, fear was struck in their hearts, and they praised God because he did the work. Not the widow's son. You and I were dead in our sin. We were lost. We had no way of coming back. But God did the work. God brought you back to life. He chose you out of all the people on this earth. And he brought you back. He saved you. So we need to give credit where credit's due. We need to be like the people in this story about the widow's son. When Jesus brought him back to life, they praised God. So when you view your salvation this way, when you understand that you didn't do anything, that I didn't do anything, this should be the result. It should change how you come in on Sunday mornings, right? It should change how you wake up every day. When you realize that you're not the one who did the work, you're going to praise your Father because He saved you. He did all of it when you didn't deserve it. Romans 5.8 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm still a sinner. And He's still giving me grace every day. So when we come in here on Sunday mornings, this should change our outlook. Because it makes God so much greater when you understand this. You see his love and his grace. And like Brian said in the children's message, you don't have to earn it, right? It's, it's not dependent on what you do. Whether or not you're living this 
perfect, saintly life, that's not the reason that God loves you. Your father loves you because you're his children. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's not because we're good people, because we aren't. He loves you because you're his. So we should praise him for that. We should praise him for doing all the work in our salvation. And second, we should stop blaming ourselves. Right? If our salvation isn't dependent on us, and it's dependent on God, then stop fretting over your sin in such a way as to think that you're just not going to make it, right? Your efforts aren't what gets you to heaven. Your good and bad scale is not what gets you to heaven. It's the grace of God, and that's it. That's all. So as you go into this week, as you go into the rest of today, praise your Father for doing all of the work. And come to him like a child. Brian was talking about, you know, Jamie and the kids, they don't do anything to earn their bed at their house, right? They don't pay for their food. They just come as children and they're loved by their parents. So realize that you have a father that loves you, a father that's willing to do all the work, and praise him for that. And stop putting so much guilt, so much burden on yourself. Let's pray. God, you are such a loving Father. You have so graciously blessed us. And you love us perfectly. Thank you so much that we don't have to earn this that you gave it to us freely, that you provided your son freely. Father, we praise you for that. We lift you up for that. And we give you all the glory and all the praise because, Father, you earned all of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You turn in your hymn books. We're going to sing number 190, Are You Washed in the Blood?
works and my works, all our striving will not save us. Only the work Christ did. So if you've realized that for the first time this morning, if you've realized that Christ is the only true place to stand, Jerry would love to talk to you about that. So would I. So would Brian. But with that, will you receive the benediction? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all.